getting things set back there at the, uh, whatever it's called back there. Yes? Keep your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay. I want you to look at these verses uh, closely. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, what Gary just read, starting with verse 13. Until we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To what? To a perfect man. What do you think that word perfect there means? Mature. Mature. What's the difference between a child and an adult? Maturity, right? So he's going to tell us not to be children no longer, but we need to be mature. And we need to be mature in our faith and in our walk with Jesus Christ. And this word perfect, mature, is what the goal, the ideal for Christians to be. Listen, do you remember when you first became a child of Jesus Christ? Do you remember when you were first converted? If it was a long time ago, are you still that same person? If it was just recent, are you still that same person? Has there been any growth in your walk with Christ? Isn't that what we're called to in a relationship with Jesus Christ? When, when the son, in the story of the prodigal son, when he came out of the pig pen and he went back to his father's house, why, in the first place, did he go back to his father's house? The Bible says that he did what? There's something he did. Came he came to his what? Senses. senses. So he realized that where he was at was not a good place and was not where he was supposed to be. And then he realized that his father's house was a much better place to be and he went back there, right? When he came to his father, what was the father's reaction? The father ran to him. Listen, it says that when he was a long way off, the father ran to him. Which is telling you that the father was looking. Right? Looking. And when he saw, he ran to him. So when the father ran to him, did he go, son, I'm so glad you're home. And then say, but you need to leave. What does it say he did? When the father saw him, he ran to him and fell on his neck and hugged him and held him. And then he put a robe on him. Why? Because he just came from the pig pen. And as far as I know, they didn't have a quarter laundry bag back then. So he came home fresh from the pig pen. Okay? So when he saw his father, his father put on a new robe on him and did what? Shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. So listen, after he did all this, did the son go, thanks father, we'll have a feast now, but then I'm going back because I can pawn this ring and I can pawn this robe and I can go back to living the lifestyle that I was in. <coughs> no, right? Of course not. I like that. Of course not. Why is it of course not? Because he went back into his father's presence and he realized where he belonged and who really loved him. When he was out living the life that he wanted, did he come to the point of realization that these people don't love me, nor do they care about me? He had friends when he had money, right? But what happened when that money ran out? So did his friends. Where did he find himself? A good Jewish boy in the middle of a pig pen. Isn't there something ironic about that? When you take the idea of that story to what it says in this text, I want you to think about what God is calling us to. And when we have given our lives to Him, what He calls us for. And what's our purpose now. Because when you are in this world, you live for the world. But Christ called you into a much, much higher and better position and a better place. But does he just walk away after the initial call? Or does he have a purpose and a plan for you? Let's go back to our texts. 
till we all come. How many? All. all. And what are we what are we to come to? Unity. Mm. How hard is it to get a group of four people to agree totally on one thing? Now there's 70 people here today. How hard is it going to get 70 people to agree on one thing? There are billions of Christians. How hard is it going to be to get us to agree on all things? So can this be done in the flesh? Or is it something that is supernatural and has to be done through God's Spirit? Growth in Christ, can it be achieved in the flesh? Or can it only be achieved through God's Spirit? So this is the difference between the flesh and the Spirit. Whether you're a carnal Christian or whether you are a Christian that has put to death the flesh and now live in the Spirit. In Christ. In his spirit. Okay, so, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Now listen, what does it say for us to be unified in? The faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Is that correct? Does that sound like what it would take for you to get your uh, degree to be a doctor? Let me rephrase that. Do you know what it takes to become a doctor so that you can be a physician? How many years of school? A lot, right? You know, right? A lot. What's being asked of you here? Does it sound like it's that complicated? And the answer is no, because even a child can do this. This is the greatest thing about your relationship and the love that God has for you that even a child can understand and come into the unity of faith. Why? Because it's a unity that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have that, all these things will follow in its place. If your eyes are focused on Christ and you are a student of His Word. Does that sound hard? Oh, you guys are looking at me like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> Listen. In this walk, in this journey, that is the Christian faith. What I'm talking to you about today, what I talked to you about last week, is not milk. It is meat. And for you to understand meat, you have to have already passed the milk. And I'm hoping that you're not still eating milk. Who requires milk? Adults? Babies. Children in the faith, right? Are you children in the faith? You've been here a long time. I've been here a long time. I remember most of your faces. You've been here a long time. What I'm talking to you about is mature. It is the meat of the Word. It is what requires this growth in Christ for you to understand and for you to put in practice in your life. You have to understand that. You have to understand that when I speak to you and I speak as your pastor, that I'm speaking meat not milk. You guys have gone past that. Okay? In this church, what I'm hoping is that when you come here, you're going to be fed solid food that will help you come into the full stature of Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't do it for you. I can prepare the meal, but you have to decide whether you're going to eat it. So until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to that perfect man. Does that scare some of you what that means, that perfect man? Again, that's the mature man, the grown-up man. The man that has a full relationship with Jesus Christ who understands what Galatians 2.20 says. What does Galatians 2.20 says? Turn it. Turn to Galatians 2.20. Ricky doesn't even need to turn here because I know he has it memorized. Galatians 2.20. Carl, do you have that? Yes. Can you read it for me? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Is that milk or is that meat? <laughs> That's meat. This is where we as God's people need to be. How do we experience and live being crucified with Christ, but yet I live, yet it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I can only do that if I grow up on His Word, experience His Word, and know Him like I know Rosa. And that Jesus is just as real to me as Rosa is today. That's not the case, then nothing that I'm saying to you is going to make sense and you're going to say, this doesn't work. There's no hope in this. <coughs> Victory in Jesus, do you believe that it can happen? Yes. It can only happen if it's actually in Jesus. And for you to have victory in Jesus, you have to know Jesus. So let's continue to look at this set of verses. Why do we need to grow up into that perfect man? To the measure of the stature of what? Not, not, not the halfness of Christ, not the three quartersness of Christ, but to the fullness of Christ. Here, here is an example of this. Let's say that your spiritual health and your spiritual walk and your spiritual power is a gas gauge. And it goes from empty to full. The scripture here is telling you that your gas gauge needs to be what? Full. And it needs to stay full. Is that right? But just like a car, when you run it and you go here, there, and yonder and everywhere, what happens to that gas? It gets depleted. And it goes less and less and less. And if you don't watch out, and you don't fill it back up, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're going to be you're going to be on empty. Now listen, your spiritual walk is the same way. You cannot come to church for an hour, well, you're an Adventist, so say two hours, three hours, sometimes your pastor's on a You cannot come to church one day out of the week for a couple of hours and expect that to fill your spiritual tank. I can't do that for you. The Sabbath school teacher can't do that for you. You have to be in charge of your spiritual walk. You have six other days that you have to feed yourself. If you're only getting fed one day, you'll be lucky if your tank is on a quarter. That's a lot of empty space, isn't it? If you want to grow into the fullness, into the full stature, the fullness of Christ, it needs to be full, and it needs to stay full. If you want victory in your life, your spiritual gas gauge needs to stay full. Is that right? The problem is, is with our lives in the 21st century, is we are so busy, we have so much responsibilities and so much stuff to do that our gas gauges are usually quarter, maybe halfway, usually between quarter and empty. And a lot of times, empty. How are we to grow in Christ if we do not feed ourselves? Let me ask you a question. And you think about this in your own personal experience. How much time do you spend watching TV? How much time do you spend reading books that will not strengthen the spiritual man? And how much time do you spend filling your spiritual gas tank up so that it will be full, so that you can grow in Christ? Only you know that answer. But you figure it out. You figure out where your gas gauge is at. That's going to show you where you're walking with Jesus Christ. It's going to show you whether He is your God or if you're worshiping idols. Why do we need to grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Verse 14. So that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Is that a true description of the day and age we live in now? Do you have to watch out for the trickery of men, for their cunning and for their plotting? <coughs> Again, all you have to do is turn on your television set, and you will see the deceitfulness in the plotting to draw you away from the truth that is found in Christ. The devil has a million ways for you to come to him. 
and he will accept everyone. God has one way. One way. And God has always had one way. And we are now called narrow-minded, bigoted, because we believe in the one way. And as long as God gives me strength and the Spirit continues to live inside of me, I pray that I never walk away from that one way. Because Jesus said plainly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, what? Except by me. Is that milk or is that meat? You have to be grounded in that and understand why we as Christians have to hold true to that and say that with a clear and clean conscience. When the world says, oh, there's many ways to God. There is one way. And the reason why Jesus is that one way is because he's the only one who paid the debt for your sin. He is the only one who brought reconciliation between fallen man and a righteous and holy God. Everything else will not bring the righteousness that God requires for you to stand in His presence and in His sight. Holy and just. Amen? Amen. Okay, so continue to read on. Verse 15, but speaking the truth, here's our problem. Speaking the truth, we look and go, what is the truth? Like Pilate when he interviewed Jesus. What was Pilate's reaction to Jesus? Pilate said, what is truth? Why did he say that? Because Pilate was a man of the world. And Pilate understood the craftiness, the trickery, and the deceitfulness of the wisdom of the world. For look, brothers and sisters, not only do we wrestle with the wisdom of the world, but we also wrestle with the deceitfulness that's within the churches. Is that right? Yes. And we have one Bible that they all read and come to this conclusion and that conclusion and this conclusion and that conclusion. So you have all these denominations all saying something different but getting it from one book. And we're to come into unity of the truth. What is the truth? And how do you possibly come to find out what it is. Nobody? Only Anybody? Right. Okay, hold on. Linda? Only through the Holy Spirit. Okay. The Bible says that the Spirit will bring you into all truth. Is that right? Ricky, what did you say? Only in Christ. In Christ. I like that. Dan? You gotta read the Bible. <laughs> you gotta read the Bible. Gary? There's a little paragraph or a few sentences that pertain to this. Can you stand up and read it loud? Try. Everything good in men and women is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit teaches us to reveal righteousness in our lives. And here, the greatest work that can be done in our world is to glorify God by the living character of Christ. God, this is the key here, God will make perfect only those who will die to self. Amen. Those who are willing to do this can say, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Is there truth in mathematics? Yes. Is there truth in mathematics? Yes. Those of you who know and like numbers, you realize that there is truth in mathematics. And through the truth of math mathematics, were they able to understand and build a rocket that can leave our Earth and travel to the moon? Yes. But the truth that is found in building that rocket, will that truth save your soul? So the question is, when it comes to truth, is ultimately, what is truth? Is it the truth I find in mathematics? Because numbers don't lie. The problem is, is numbers can be manipulated, right? But the thing I like about mathematics is it is purity. It's pure. And it's, there, there is a foundation there. But will it save my soul? The answer is no. Right? So there's all kinds of sciences out there, right? Is there truth in that science? 
Gravity is the truth that if I jump off of this and don't put my legs down, I'll probably get hurt. Yeah. Will that save my soul? No. So, when it comes to salvation, there's truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if I want to know real truth, I only need to look at one place. So I can filter out a bunch, most, of all this deception and fluff that the world has to offer as truth. And I can put my gaze and focus on real truth, the truth that will last for eternity. Is that right? And that truth is in Jesus. How do I get to know Jesus? By the word he has given us. And through the understanding of his word, by the influence of the Holy Spirit, then I can come to truth. Does that make sense to you guys? But if I take this book and I only open it up one day a week, and maybe not even then, and then I go home and not look at it until I come back that one day, how much gas am I putting in my spiritual tank? How do you expect to be able to discern truth from error if your gas tanks are on empty or they're running low? How do you expect... Let's go back to our text. Let's go back to the text. How do you expect to be able to speak the truth in love if you don't know, number one, what the truth is? And I'm not talking about this word. I'm talking about the word himself. How do you expect to talk about and speak about and preach about the truth in love that is Jesus Christ if you don't have a relationship with Him. How do you expect to speak anything in love if your spiritual love tank, like your spiritual gas tank, yeah. is on empty? It too has to be full. For you cannot give love unless you're filled with love. And you cannot be filled with love unless you know love. And that love, again, is Jesus Christ. None of this is profitable. None of this will work unless it is grounded and built firmly on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into Him, who is head, that is Christ. Now listen, in these sets of verses, He continues to show the difference between children and grown-ups. That we're no longer to be children tossed to and fro. That we need to grow up into the fullness, the fullness of Christ. And that we need to continue to grow so that we can speak the truth in love. So is Christian spiritual growth important? Yes. Is it a requirement? Yes. That's what you need to realize. It's not just important, it is a requirement of all those who name the name of Christ. Christ did not tell us, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest and you never have to wake up and do anything again. What he says is, come to me, and I will give you rest, and I will allow you to grow in me, so that it's no longer you trying to strive in your own power but it will be you resting in my power, and I will use my power in your weakness to show the world that I need you. Amen? Does that sound like good news? Yeah. Does that sound like it's something that you can actually achieve, and it's doable? Yes. That, brothers and sisters, is the faith of Jesus. Now, Again, I'm not giving you milk, I'm giving you meat. When you understand the faith of Jesus, you realize that having faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus go hand in hand. And when you grow up into Christ and you become mature in this knowledge, you realize that they're one and the same. But like I told you last week, the problem with the churches today is that they're preaching faith in Jesus and that's it. Where there's no growth, no victory, no maturity in Christ. 
So we have been called to preach and teach the truth as it's found in Christ, the faith of Jesus, to prepare a people who are able to stand in His presence in their flesh when He comes back. Have you ever thought about what it's going to be like to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory? In His divinity? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Sorry, Revelation chapter 1. Now, if there was really a saint who loved Jesus, don't you think it would have been John the Apostle? John was called the disciple who Jesus loved, right? John had a special and unique relationship with Jesus Christ more than the others. And John, in his old age, banished to the island of Patmos because they couldn't kill this poor old man. They didn't know what to do with him, so they said, well, let's put him in salt mines and that way he'll lose his influence. God is a great God. And he probably wrote the greatest book that's contained for the last days. That's the book of Revelation. But I want you to see John's reaction. Did John know Jesus? Yes. Did John see Jesus in his flesh? Yes. Did John see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Yes. Now, I want you to see John's reaction when he sees Jesus in his full divine presence here in Revelation chapter 1. Excuse me, I didn't turn there because I was busy talking. This is why I never finished sermons. But that's why there's always part two and part three and part five. Okay, so. Let's start with, um, start with verse five. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and, was, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, he has made us, don't you love this? What has he made us? Kings, kings and priests. To his God and Father, to him be glory, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with what? Wow. And every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will what? They will mourn because of him. So, is this speaking of history in the past or is this speaking of history in the future? Is this speaking of those who will be alive in the last days at His second coming? And what does it say? Every eye will see Him, and He will come in the clouds. What is that? We call that the second coming. Is that right? When He comes this time, He's not going to be clothed in humanity. He's not going to be a helpless babe lying in a manger. Now I want you to see John's reaction as we continue to read on to this. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 8. Jesus' words. If you have the Bible that's in red, he goes, I am the, Oma, the, o, the Alpha and the Omega. That's the A to the Z. He's the beginning and the end, says the Lord. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice. As of what? Who was this voice that he heard? This was the voice of Jesus himself. Have you ever heard how loud a trumpet can be? Those of you who play the trumpet, think of how high that note can be ear piercing. Why do you think they blew trumpets before the battle and in the battle? Because they could hear the trumpet over the sound of the battle. That's how loud it is. This was the voice of Christ, and his voice was as loud as a trumpet, and he didn't need a microphone. Verse 11, saying, I am the Alpha, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he lists those seven churches. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw, what? <laughs> mm. Those of you who have lost faith in the sanctuary service, in the sanctuary message that the Adventists preach, if you no longer believe it, you don't think it's relevant today, 
Where does John see Jesus? What does he see Jesus standing by? Seven lampstands. Where are these lampstands at? In the sanctuary where? In heaven. Is that right? So when Adventists uh, teach and preach the sanctuary message, where are they getting it from? Can they?